Hello. Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Um, for any new subscribers that have hit the subscribe button since my last video, welcome. This is another Spring of Spaniel video and more specifically, it will cover absolutely everything you need to know about dog breeding, whether that's a Springer Spaniel or another dog. It's been one hell of a journey to get to this particular point of the end where all the puppies have gone. So what I wanna do is sort of walk you through absolutely everything that I learned and try and put it into a useful video if you are thinking of breeding from your dog, Springer Spaniel, Labrador, whatever it may be. This video will be filled with tips, hints, things to think about in terms of finances, paperwork, feeding, weaning, whelping, everything. Everything you could possibly think of that goes into a pregnancy in a dog, I'll have it covered. The first tip I received, this actually came from my vet. They said everything you could possibly want to know about the entire process of pregnancy, breeding, whelping, feeding, vaccinations, absolutely everything is all contained in this book. It's called The Book of the Bitch, and this is essentially your dog breeding Bible. I'll put a link to it in the description below for where you can get it from. This was a lifesaver on actually a number of occasions, and this is very, very good just to check in to see that you're doing things right at the right time. The first big tip, get this book. Okay, first things first, I really underestimated how much time would actually be involved with the, the puppies. I uh, pretty much had no summer. So this sort of took place, the mating took place in April. Pip had the puppies right at the end of June. And essentially I didn't really do a lot up until the middle of September. Bear that in mind in terms of the time you need dedicating it to raising and rearing the puppies and of course, caring for your pregnant dog as well. The other things to consider are, do you have the space to raise a litter of puppies? Now, the space is absolutely fine for the first three or four weeks because they don't really move around a lot and they need to be contained in the box. But after that particular time, do you have the space to let them roam around? Now, another good thing to debate and think about is the season of which you're having the puppies. Now, I was fortunate enough that the summer of 2022 was actually a very, very dry summer. So we only had really one or two days of rain max uh, all throughout the, the, the period of rearing and raising the puppies. So they could roam outside, no problem, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't cause a bit hell of a mess inside. If you're doing it in winter, you obviously need to be careful that A, the pups don't get too chilled and cold, and B, it could make a terrible muddy mess of your house. If you do have a separate garage that you can keep warm or a separate building where you can keep them warm, um, that's ideal. Energy, you need a hell of a lot of energy going into rearing puppies. Quite often you'll be woken up in the middle of the night because of crying or you'll need to clean up some poo. 70% um, of your time will be cleaning up poo, so get used to that. You need a lot of energy and a good sense of humor for it. And lastly, just bear in mind that there's quite a few cut. And the last thing to consider is money as well. So there's quite a few financial outlays, um, specifically actually at the start of the process for things like health checks for the dogs, vet checks, various other things that I'll, I'll detail a little bit further on in the video. But yeah, just bear in mind that although you may be looking forward to receiving some income from the puppies, just bear in mind that that will need to be outlaid with certain costs uh, at the same time. And I'll detail as much as I, I can for you as to what I purchased, where it, where the, where the outlays went. Okay, so let's start this story right at the very beginning, back in April when Pip met her mate for the first time. Now, as a prelude to this particular clip, one of the questions you may ask is, how do you find a mate for your bitch? I'm on a quite a few Facebook groups in relation to those areas, so it's quite easy to then ask, you know, if there's anybody got a particular stud dog, Springer Spaniel in the local area, and eventually after a couple of phone calls, I find someone fairly close by, probably about 20 miles away, which is absolutely perfect. And because the last thing you want to do is obviously find a mate and you, know, you have to traipse halfway up and down the country to meet them, but also you're not 
necessarily guaranteed to know when the bitch is in, in heat and when her ovulation is, is bang on unless you do various tests which cost even more money and you don't want to mess that up if you're traveling halfway up and down the country. So from, from my point of view and finding a mate it was quite useful. If you have a local shoot near you and you have a working working dog, working bitch, then that's the first place to, to go. If you, if you don't have a working dog, I think there's quite a few forums and, and dog sites where you can search for a, a mate for your dog as well. One key thing to note is whilst you're looking for a mate is to make sure, and this is all to do with responsible breeding, so I have to put this in. A lot of people will probably wouldn't do this bit, but I got PIP health checked and most of the tests came back clear, but she was a carrier of um, a couple of elements. Now, being a carrier doesn't mean it affects her clinically or healthily in any way, shape or form. She's just a carrier of a particular strand of, of gene. So it was very important to make sure that the dog that she mated with wasn't a carrier of those same genes, because obviously those genes could then mutate and it would give the puppies some sort of genetic mutation where they wouldn't be as healthy as they possibly could be. And that also has ramifications and implications a little bit further down the line, which I'll come to in terms of talking about kennel club endorsements. Anyway, let's go rewind back to April and the point of when Pip met her sire. So today is hopefully going to be the day that Pip in here loses her virginity. She doesn't really know what's coming, um, but she has met her potential boyfriend before. So they've been on a first date. This is not a one night stand, okay? So this is going to be the second date. Yes, it's a bit floozy, I know that. But I think you're ready, aren't you, Pippin? You're a bit twitchy, aren't you? Your rear half, oh dear, look. Yes, it's, even if you just talk to her, please, she gets a bit excited. So I think, I think she's ready. So fingers crossed, obviously I'm not gonna video and cover the deed itself, but uh, I'll give you an update once she's met up with the, the sire, the dog. Oh, it's gone. Fingers crossed. Safe to say we visited the, the sire dog twice based on the time lapse between mating and the pregnancy. It was the first attempt that actually worked. The interesting thing to know about the mating process is once the deed is done, there ends up being something called a tie. What actually happens is, is the second photograph here, the one in the middle, um, the female bitch's muscles of her vagina contract and, and squeeze the dog's penis, but also at the same time, the dog's penis expands. So they're both properly locked in together and they end up sort of facing away from each other, sort of bum to bum. But actually it's quite painful because if you think of the position they're actually in. So it's very important for the sire owner and the bitch owner to actually just put a lead on them at, at that point and make sure they don't try and pull apart because actually it could hurt the genitalia. So it's quite important just to keep them calm and just let them just let them settle down. Now, the tie can last from anywhere between 10 minutes up to an hour. So be patient and <laughs> think about things to chat about when you're both stood there over the tied dogs. Thankfully, Pip's first time probably took 15, 20 minutes, it wasn't that bad, but essentially you've just got to wait for all the dog's muscles to relax and all the, the, the female bitch's muscles to relax and then the two essentially will naturally come apart. Okay, next up. Once the deed has been done, after a few weeks, you can take the pregnant bitch to the vets to check and see if there are any embryos or any puppies in the dog's stomach. I did with Pip and this was the outcome. Good news everybody, we just popped into the vets and Pip's had a little scan and they have confirmed that there are a few puppies in the tummy. Now the vet's not allowed to tell us how many puppies are in there for insurance reasons but it's good to know that the mating went well and Pip's going to be a mummy. So this is day 30 officially. People would ask, you know, you know, can you tell that Pip's pregnant? Can you tell there's puppies in there? And no, you can't really. I mean, she's been off her food a little bit. Uh, she's been a lot more tired recently. So uh, I guess those are hallmarks of something's not quite the same as it was before. And nipples have grown a little bit. Um, but other than that, 
you wouldn't know that she's pregnant at all. Something I found is if you split the pregnancy into three thirds, the majority of the change in the bitch happens in the final third in those final few weeks. So you won't notice much to start with. You can get some worming treatment that goes into the, the, the bitch's food, which then passes through to the puppies in the womb, which is very important because the first few days are, are pretty critical. So helping worm them just essentially breeds healthier pups when they're, when they're born. You can get that from your vet and essentially it's a, a syringe of white liquid that goes into the dog's food. You also need to worm them after they're born at certain intervals. Okay, now onto whelping. Get yourself a cup of tea for this bit. Mm. Cheers. So whelping was the part that I was probably most nervous about only because typically that when the dog begins to give birth, it normally happens during the night where everything is relaxed, it's dark, it's quiet. But of course you can't rely on the vet's assistance because most vets don't work during the night. So again, this book came in very, very handy just for a list of things that you might need. How do you know it's coming? Well, give or take, depending on the dog, the pregnancy takes a certain amount of days. Once that day is up, give or take, and the dog will be there or thereabout. So probably about a week before that, I started preparing a whelping area. This included building the whelping box, and here is a picture of me celebrating with a beer completing it. And as well as that whelping box, I added some, some like fur liners that allowed liquid to drain through. So when basically when the puppies wee, that it goes straight through. It's very, very important for the first few days just to keep everywhere as clean as possible in the whelping box, um, which is easier said than done. A couple of heated pads or like little hot water bottles to keep, uh, keep them warm. And also the whelping box that I had, as you, as you saw in the picture, was quite open. So over the top, I had some it's almost like netting material, I suppose, that had, was dark and had some holes in the top. That just allowed to create more of a cave-like feel. Uh, another sign that the pregnancy is coming is the dog may go outside and start digging, as in digging, pretending to dig a cave because she's nearly ready to, to give birth. Once that starts happening, you know that the pregnancy isn't too far away. The birth itself, Pip was brilliant because it was probably about 2.30 in the morning and Pip is not allowed up upstairs. And without even thinking, she bounded up the stairs as if to say, it's time, help me. And basically, as soon as I woke up, she went back down the stairs, she got into a whelping box, and it was simply a case of, of waiting. So you want to let the dogs get on with it. You know, typically giving birth um, to puppies is a natural process for them, so long as the dogs are in good health. First real sign that you know when the, the puppy's coming is a lot of licking happens. You wouldn't really know it. It, it. Cut. Do you mind? So Pip uh, started giving birth at around 2.30 in the morning. And the whole pregnancy process probably took around seven hours, I think, because the final puppy was born around 9.30 in the morning. Unfortunately, Pip's first puppy was stillborn, which made me very nervous about what was to follow. The second one out about 20 to 25 minutes after that from memory was a, a great fully fledged healthy puppy and then the, the, the other eight after that were equally as, as healthy which was, which was great. Don't know if you'll be able to see this puppy. The first five puppies came out and then the afterbirth came out, but actually a further three puppies came out after that happened. So it doesn't always go by the book. So yeah, eight puppies came out in total. Obviously, depending on the, the breed of dog, depending on the health of the dog and the age of the dog, it could take a lot longer, it could take less time. And good mommy, Pippin. All right, now let's move on to weaning. Now this is where the fun really begins because the first three weeks, really, it's down to the, the bitch, the mom of the litter, to uh, support them, to clean them, to give them milk and help them grow. So you don't really have a lot to do other than keeping an eye on them and just making sure they don't really get injured in any way, which isn't really possible to do because they're, they're normally just in the whelping box with the, with the mum. 
You might want to keep an eye on the mum just to make sure she doesn't squash them by mistake, for instance. But otherwise, it's fairly plain sailing compared to the, the final six weeks. Around week three or four is when I started weaning them on solid food. And as you'll see in a moment, I, uh, I started that process with a mixture of sort of dried, mixed in with wet food, but I also sort of soak the kibble in, uh, in warm water just because the, the, the teeth for the puppies are only just come through, but they couldn't manage to, to bite through solid, solid kibble, solid biscuit at that point. So it was just sort of softening it to make it a little bit more palatable for them. It's weaning time. Um, so basing the amount the pup needs on this quite handy little guide here from Millie's Wolfheart. Um, I'm going to wean the pups on something called a Riverside mix, which is quite high in proteins and fish and things like that. And the pups are about just under one and a half kilograms. You can see the current weight and the age. So I started weaning them a couple of days ago, so between three and four weeks. So just aiming for the lowest sort of value on, on that roughly, um, about 40 grams per pup per day. The puppies' tummies are only very small, really, so they can only take a small amount of, of food. So these are the bits of kibble that they'll, they'll have. Basically, I put them in a bowl and soak them in lukewarm water just so they're easier to, to digest. The pup's teeth are, are through, but they're not particularly handy at crunching biscuits yet. So basically, I'm going to th feed them three or four times in a day, so you break up that 40 grams into about 10 grams if you feed them four times. So 10 grams multiplied by eight puppies is 80. So normally what we do is weigh our 80 grams. There we go. Soak it in a little water. And let that soak for about half an hour. And then with that, with each individual pup, I'll give a spoonful of this butcher's tripe. This is what the mum has had all the way through her lifetime. She was even weaned on this too. The puppies are used to it, obviously, coming through the milk. It goes into a big bowl, which I'll show you next. The weight and the feeding amount is obviously just a guideline. It just depends on uh, how the puppy is doing and how much they're taking on. And then the food goes into a little round bowl like this. I do four puppies in one four puppies in another. Sometimes they eat outside, although it doesn't always go to plan because puppies stand in the bowl. Come on, think about it. There we go. The joys of puppy eating. You get it absolutely everywhere. So you have to sponge them down and keep them clean. Nice and clean? Nice and clean. But of course, along with solid food in one end, at the other end, you're going to get lots and lots of <laughs> So around the same time, around about week three, week four, also a case of making sure the puppies come into an area that is then full of noises, essentially, so house noises. So the puppies at this point, their hearing is gonna be developed a little bit more, their their sense of smell has developed a little bit more. So the more they get used to all the different sights, sounds, smells, noises within a household environment, the better. That's everything from using the hoover to maybe mowing the lawn outside to getting used to a lawn mower sound, getting used to people talking, getting used to music, getting used to the TV. You know, anything a typical Springer Spaniel might experience, really. I mean, there was a lot of whistles as well. I use a whistle for, for Pip, both for recall and when I used it for training. So we used the whistle in here quite a lot so they could get used to the whistle sound. Aside from noises, sights, sounds and smells, it's all about learning to, to play. They are beginning to get a sense of putting things in their mouths. Normally that's another puppy's ear or foot. Yeah, and those toys can consist of maybe little balls of string, uh, tiny little balls that they knock around that maybe has a little bell in them. Any sort of baby toys, really. Little bits of rope with knots on the end that they can play tug of war with. Any little toys like, like that's great. Four weeks old, nearly coming out of the box. So we moved them from a very quiet space in, a, in the front room and brought them in here. Now, at the time, I had a one and a half year old son and a three year old son. And I have to say, it was great for them to get to know the puppies and play with them. But also, equally, I think it was great for the puppies to have them around. <laughs> Let's say give him a stroke. 
That's it. Oh, she likes you, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Gentle Arthur. Yes. Oh. Oh. Very tired, that one, isn't it? As mentioned previously, the litter that we had born in the summer, so we were quite fortunate that to allow them to play and give them a bigger space to poo, it's been quite important to allow them to get out and have a little run. So in, in the Book of the Bitch, they recommend sort of building a run out of bits of cardboard, really, just an area that is um, safe for them to play in, but separate to where they sleep, because they don't really want to poo or wee where they sleep. Also within the whelping box, not a, a door, just a sliding part of the wood that they can climb in and out of quite easily. That was quite handy because it allows them to come in and out as they please. And also I kept a couple of strips of cardboard over the top of the whelping box because during the day they, they are going to do a lot of sleeping when they're quite active. And so that little bit of darkness just allows them to go into a, a corner and, and go to sleep quite easily, which is which is good for them and good for you. Now at this point, week three, four, all the way through to sort of week six, seven, becomes a bit of a blur. They grow really quickly, they're playing all the time, their personalities start to come through. It's absolutely great, but it is a hell of a lot of hard work because they will begin whining more, crying more. You've got to clean them a lot because typically if they're not walking in their own food, <laughs> they're walking in their own poo. The biggest negative that I had with the puppies is when they suddenly wake up at sort of two or three in the morning and they're all sort of crying and playing. Even a big whelping box doesn't really contain them anymore. They can climb out. So if they can climb out, that means they can poo anywhere. So we had a process of putting like puppy pads down and we tried to create a perimeter fence for them essentially you need the army to create one if you're gonna make it puppy proof so they always escape at a few times at two or three in the morning i would come downstairs and there would be just dollops of poo on the puppy pads which is absolutely fine and at the far end would be all the puppies and then the poo would be in the middle and then I would come into the room from the other end. And of course, what would then happen is the puppies get really excited that you've arrived in the room. And that's it. We have a code brown. It's a total shitstorm. What then happens is the puppies begin running towards you. They run through the sea of poo. They clamber all over each other, which means they put <laughs> poo pads all over one another, cover each other with poo. It's two or three in the morning, you're half asleep. It's absolutely chaos, which is why if I was ever to do it again, I would not do it in a house with little kids. I would do it in a separate secure building, like a, a barn or something like that. I don't have that luxury, but that's why I definitely wouldn't do it again because it just ruins your, <laughs> your floors, poo gets everywhere. It's just a constant cleaning process. It is now week eight and the puppies have their jabs and microchips today at the vets, which is good. So the first puppies are actually going to their new homes tomorrow, which is kind of sad because you get to know all their personalities and, and get to know them a bit. So obviously there's a little bit of emotion attached, but I'm broken. <laughs> All right, so now we're through the weaning process. The pups have grown up. They're a great bundle of fun, but it's come to the time where if you haven't already got buyers for the pups, then it's time to start advertising them and, and trying to sell them. Nine weeks, three going up north this weekend. Far too big, I'm far too boisterous now. I advertised on gun dog specific websites because these puppies are a working dock, they have a good pedigree. I advertise on gun dogs direct which costs £10. I advertise on somewhere called champ dogs that costs around £45. I advertise on a more generic site called pets for homes which costs about £12. The kennel club have a find a puppy which is essentially their, their advertisement because it lists kennel club registered puppies and that costs uh, about £25. So look at about £100 really if you want to absolutely advertise everywhere. The sites that probably did the best for me were Champ Dogs and the Kennel Club. In fact we ended up selling three puppies through the, 
the Kennel Club Find the Puppy Scheme. So that actually worked really, really well. Now I'm mentioning the Kennel Club, it's about this time, around six, seven weeks, that you'll need to start all the registration of the puppies if you want to register them with the, the Kennel Club because the application to register each puppy takes quite a while to do and of course you've got eight puppies, oh, I had eight puppies to do. And then of course the processing time at the Kennel Club takes a while to do also. So ideally when it gets to eight, nine weeks, the puppies are then ready to go to their new homes and you would need all that paperwork ready to give to the new owners. At this point, you'll also need to go back to the vets um, to give them their first jabs. Typically, you want them to come with that first vaccination. I think it's more peace of mind rather than anything else because you know they're on the process of being fully vaccinated and they can go outside in the, in the big wide world a little bit sooner. But interestingly, my vet said to me it's not always the best option because the first vaccination that they get, there's different variants of it, as in there's different you know, drug companies that provide the vaccination. And ideally, you want the first vaccination to be the same strand of drug, if you like, as the second vaccination. And often, when breeders get the first vaccinations done, then obviously pass the puppies over to the new owners, the new owners register them with their vet and get the second vaccination done, it's not always the same strand or same drug, if you like, as the first vaccination. And so, I'm not sure if that causes problems or if it's not as foolproof. I wasn't really sure on the vet's point, but essentially the vet was saying it's really you should get both vaccinations done by the, the same vet because they know it's the same strand or the same drug that they use to vaccinate the animal, which makes sense. So yeah, the puppies then have their jabs. It's then simply a case of sorting out absolutely all the paperwork. First things first, you've got your kennel club documentation. Then you've got to activate five weeks of free health insurance for the pups, which is again done through the kennel club, documents to go with that. Then there's the microchip details, vaccination details. Um, for this group of spaniels, there's the kennel club endorsement form, which is all to do with responsible breeding. And there's also the tail docking certificate, which is also combined with the microchip certificate, so there's bits to fill out there. Horses then got a puppy pack with some food, feeding guidelines, um, and just a list of things to purchase that a new puppy owner might not have thought of. Oh, one other document I forgot is the puppy sales contract. Um, it's basically just outlines the details of the dog, details of the sire and the dam, uh, the purchase price deposit, basically just covers the breeder for uh, most things and also have details on how to lift the endorsement. So yes, a lot of paperwork per puppy times eight. The dogs in my litter are staggered going to new homes, two going today and then three going the next weekend. But if you are planning on getting rid of all of your puppies in the litter at one go, just be prepared for the amount of paperwork that is required. And sometimes you can't do it a long time in advance because you only get certain details from the kennel club or you'll only get the vaccination or microchip details from the vet once they're actually done so there we go in terms of how much everything costs from that start to finish here's a list of all the expenses that were totaled up so as you can see this is everything from the initial purchases of things like the whelping box heat pads to keep the puppies warm bits and pieces for the puppy run all the way through to advertising costs and all the costs associated with vet bills kennel club registrations if you're out there thinking you're going to breed your dog purely for profit purposes be aware it might not be as much profit as you think it is because the amount of time effort and money that goes into breeding is actually quite significant now, especially if you ticking all the boxes and doing it through the kennel club and making sure you're going through the process of responsible breeding. The other thing to note is HMRC may well be on your case because any profits you make from being a breeder, you then need to disclose to HMRC. That's the tax man for you. But then again, it depends what you sell the puppies for and if your expenses and your revenue from the puppies match each other, you don't have any tax to pay. So there we have it. That is the entire puppy breeding process 
from start to finish. It's quite a long video. Thank you for, for sticking with it. I hope it's been useful for you. As ever, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them just like I did with the Springer Spaniel training video. Take it easy guys. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. Um, much appreciated and see you next time.